God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So three or four weeks ago, I was uh, hanging out with some friends of friends, and they were talking about the church that they go to. They go to an Anglican church here in Toronto, and I'm not sure that everybody that was there realized that, that I'm ordained. So they were talking in a very free manner about their, their pastor, who's a, a friend of mine, actually. And uh, they were saying how, you know, they kind of like his sermons because they're not too long. And so I said, so how long is, is too long uh, at your church? And they said, oh, anything over 10 minutes would be extraordinary. Thought, yeah, so then we had a little discussion about some traditions where people preach for half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour long, that kind of thing. So then as they were talking, one of them mentioned that this pastor sends out, as part of an email that goes out every week, uh, a short little reflection sort of piece. And, um, and somebody said, uh, among the group said, uh, yeah, they're, they're okay, but, you know, they're just a little too Christological for my taste. You know, too much Christ. You know? And then someone else at, the, at, the, at this group said, well, you know, he is a Christian after all. And they kind of looked at each other and kind of, kind of laughed. And I realized that part of what was going on here is that uh, these folks that I was, I was having this, uh, this little break with, uh, for them, they weren't entirely on board with the whole Jesus as Christ thing. Uh, that for them, uh, Jesus is a good guy. Jesus is a teacher, and Christianity is about being a good person and, and so forth. And uh, this is actually a fairly common view in our society, this idea of a kind of Christless Christianity. Um, now, they don't deny Jesus. They think Jesus is a swell guy. Uh, they think Jesus is a cool guy. They want to follow Jesus, and they might even say it. They're followers of Jesus. But they wouldn't necessarily accept the Christ aspect of it, that he was the Son of God, that he was crucified for our sins, and, and, and so forth. As I said, we encounter this uh, this attitude a lot, and I think we can even trace it back to the age of the Enlightenment, when there was this temptation to collapse all religions into basically ethical systems, or you might say wisdom teachings. Uh, so in other words, every religion became about wisdom, and about the conveyance of wisdom. And they're not entirely off the mark with this insight, because there is a lot of stuff in the Gospel where Jesus is clearly aligning himself with the wisdom tradition, he's saying things that are meant to improve people's lives, to help them uh, live better, to be more ethical and good as people. Uh, there's, there's lots of examples of Jesus saying things, you know. Even something like, um, you know, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you is clearly a saying from within the wisdom tradition. If you want to get a sense of what I mean when I say the wisdom tradition, uh, open up a Bible and take a look at the book of Proverbs. Uh, it's just full of all these sort of like almost pithy little sort of uh, sayings that were designed to help people live better, more, more ethical and, and good lives. And there's nothing necessarily wrong with that at all. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I think that it is problematic in a couple of ways for those who would call themselves Christians. Um, for, for one thing, this kind of uh, faith uh, fails to deal with the claims that are made in the scriptural witness. Um, the Bible is pretty clear about Jesus and his role in salvation history. And if you just kind of pick and choose the wisdom parts of that tradition and not the others then you're really kind of failing to deal with the witness of Scripture on its own terms. It, it sort of demands that you sort of make a judgment about those claims and not just simply ignore them. The other thing, it, it, it asks a lot less of us, this kind of a wisdom tradition uh, way of approaching religion, because what it means is that we can basically pick and choose uh, the parts of the wisdom that we want to follow. And then maybe we're not always so wise. You know, maybe we kind of ignore that thing about, about you know, doing well into others and, and so forth. So it kind of encourages a buffet-style uh, faith. And, and you encounter this a lot nowadays with people sort of going around through the smorgasbord of, of world religions with a toothpick and just kind of taking uh, a little bit of melon here and a little bit of uh, prosciutto there. You know, they, they're not sort of getting the full meal. They're just sort of like picking and choosing what they, what they like. Yeah. But I think the biggest problem with this kind of approach is that it fails to deal fundamentally with the problem of sin. I mean, basically, Christianity and really all religions that are, that are out there are really a response to this problem of sin and what do we do about sin. And Christianity has the critique that no matter how hard we try to be good, and we should try to be good, we will always fail. We will always fall short of the glory of God created us to have. We will always fall short. We can never be perfect. And no matter what we do, it will never be enough. And in response to that, we have a faith that says that there is something beyond us 
something beyond ourselves that gives us that assistance to reach that perfection that would otherwise be impossible for us. It's where that Christ part comes in. You see, the cross stands in history as an event and a reality that asks us, uh, you know, what do you believe about God? I mean, fundamentally, when you look at the fact of the crucifixion, and I don't know anybody that actually denies that the crucifixion happened, it stands in history as a moment when we have to decide, what do we believe about God? There are people that deny the divinity of the resurrection and things like that simply because they have a hard time believing that God would do such a thing. Uh, I actually went to to seminary with somebody that was working on a PhD thesis about how to get around the crucifixion because she found it so distasteful. And she would even use that word distasteful, that that God would would kill this man for us. And so she had this challenge of how to to get around. (laughs) Again, she was trying to create a Christless Christianity. So the cross stands in history as this event and this reality that causes us to have this moment of choice. What do we believe to be true about God? I believe it to be true about God, that he loves us so much that he was willing to go through that kind of suffering to save us from our sin. That's a very solid, standard tradition. But what does that really mean, that phrase? Well, I think it means that we have to be open to the possibility that God would sacrifice for us. That God would go through suffering for us. That God loves us that much. It's interesting to me that that many people who have a problem with the crucifixion don't have a problem at all with the Incarnation. Like, uh, you know, like they, they have a, a good time with the sort of baby Jesus. Like, baby Jesus is good. Uh, but as soon as you start talking about the adult Jesus being crucified for us, that's, that's much harder for them to, to stomach. So if we believe that God loves us so much that he can solve the problem of sin by giving us grace to, to surpass anything that we might have done wrong in our lives, if we believe that's possible, then we can look at that cross and we can see a symbol of our redemption and our hope and a ground for our faith. Beloved, as you encounter this uh, kind of Christless Christianity in the world that's just kind of all about Jesus as a cool guy, um, please don't be too critical of those folks. I mean, don't, don't attack them. But I think that for yourself, you can kind of critique and maybe push those people a little bit. You can sort of say, well, if that's true, then what do you do about all the rest of the stuff about sin? You know, what do you, I mean, there, there's something here that we can, we can reflect on and we can engage these folks with. You know, what do you do when you do wrong? What do you do when you need something which is a hope and a promise beyond yourself? Um, today is the, the anniversary of, of 9-11, and I'm going to share a story um, uh, about that, that day, uh, which some of you may have, have heard before, but I think it's a fitting kind of conclusion to the sermon. Uh, my seminary uh, was, of course, in Connecticut, and uh, one of my, uh, she was basically the chaplain to our community and our kind of spiritual mentor for us. She and her husband, who was a clinical psychologist, were uh, at uh, 9-11. They were at the, uh, very close to the ground zero, where there's this church called Trinity Church. It's a very big, famous, wealthy American church. And they have so much money that they have this, like, institute for religion next door that produces all kind of media and stuff. And so they were doing an interview of the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, at the time. So he was there, and my uh, seminary chaplain basically was there, and her husband. And they, had, they were running a little late when they arrived into the city. And as they were going into the, the building uh, across the street from Trinity, there was paper already like filtering down, some of it like burning. And her husband is, is like, you know, what is this? But uh, Sandy was like, you know, come on, come on, you know, we're running late. And kind of they rushed into the building. Uh, pretty soon they were aware something was going wrong, uh, then the first building collapsed. And after the first building collapsed, they realized that their lives were very much in jeopardy and that they could die at any moment. Uh, so the people that were gathered there started to organize their response. There were some fire marshals that had been designated. They were basically the janitorial staff. And you know why it makes sense to have them as fire marshals? Because they have the keys. They have the keys to everywhere in the building as well as under the building. And they already had evacuation routes planned so that they could escape from the building without having to go to the service level of the, of the street, which was already filling with smoke and dust and was, was quite dangerous. So they had another problem, though, which was that they had some children there uh, that were part of a, a church daycare. And so they decided that they were going to take the children. And so they paired up each child with an adult to hold them by the hand or carry them if necessary through the labyrinthine tunnels they were about to go through. So having figured out some of those practical things about how they were going to make their escape and thinking that they were going to die at any moment, perhaps, uh, they decided to pray. And the Archbishop of Canterbury led them in that prayer. 
And what he did was he, he gathered them all in a circle. They gathered them all in a circle. And he, uh, he said to them, uh, you know, let us pray. And he started to pray. And, and Sandy said, you know, she'll never forget his prayer. What he prayed was that no matter what happened in the next few minutes, hours, and perhaps days, that no matter who they met, they would see Christ in that person and be Christ to that person. That's what he prayed. And then they got their kids and they started to make the journey out. And uh, they emerged from the street eventually onto the street level and then uh, made their way to the water. And then there were just boats going back and forth from the island of Manhattan to the other shore. Just fishermen and, and just tour operators and just anybody who had a boat was just ferrying people across. Uh, so they, they made their way across and then eventually to Connecticut and then eventually back home. I firmly believe that in a situation like that where you're facing your own death, and the possibility of suffering of thousands of people, that a tradition that relies really on wisdom or an ethical system about being good is not sufficient. It is not enough. That we need something which is a hope and a ground for faith that is beyond ourselves and anything we may do or not do. And that is what the cross represents to me. That is what the cross represents to me. A foundation for faith and hope and a God who loves us that much.